All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Andrew Carco with United Way Fox Cities, and we are very excited to have you on today for the very first session of our four-part series of This Story Starts With You. Just going to uh, take care of a few quick housekeeping items for all of you. Um, you are on mute for the time being. However, we do want this to be an interactive session today. So there will be some poll questions. Uh, be ready to maybe answer some of those. Um, if when it comes time for the panel and time to open it up for questions, if you would like to ask your question verbally, you can raise your hand and our moderator will then um, potentially ask you to unmute so you can ask your question. You can, of course, always submit questions in the Q&A box as well, if you would like to do so that way. And last but not least, we are recording this session and we'll be sharing that out with all of our registered attendees. So you can share that out. We'll also be posting it on our website and our YouTube channel as well. So with that, I just quickly want to let you know, as I said, this is a four part series. This story starts with you. Uh, today, we're gonna to be talking about how our next sessions after this, we have coming up one in June on education, one in July around financial stability. And then we skip into August because August is our campaign community kickoff event where you can attend that and learn lots about United Way. And then in September, we're gonna pick up and end the series with all about Alice and Alice 101 and simulation. Um, so we hope you will be able to attend the other sessions as well. But as I said, today's session is our first one, and it's all focusing on health. Now, at United Way Fox Cities, we do support and invest in agencies that both uh, provide services for both physical and mental health services. Today, it's specifically focused around the mental health services of the health portion of what we're talking about. Um, it is an, a challenge that we've been facing here in the Fox Cities, and it continues to be a challenge, as we'll hear from our panelists, and they'll talk about that. So we're very excited uh, for that. So just to kind of tee up a little bit of background information and info, uh, trivia, if you will, on mental illness. But first, just some, one in five people, 20% of our population, um, and it might be even higher now. I'm looking at our panelists, I'm not sure, but one in five people struggle with mental illness in our country, in our state, and locally here in the Fox Cities. So that's an astounding number. Uh, so quick fact or fiction for you, and I'm going to bring up a poll uh, question for all of you to answer. Um, fact or fiction, what do you think? The average delay between onset of symptoms of mental illness and intervention is two to three years. So people will wait two to three years before getting help. And I apologize about the train. <laughs> I'm just going to give it a few more seconds here to get more people to answer. Okay, and I think I'll end the poll in three, two, and one, and I'll share the results. So over 80% of you say this is fact, that people will wait two to three years. Now, what's the answer? Unfortunately, over 80% of you were wrong. It's fiction. The reason why, though, is the truth is actually it's eight to 10 years. People will wait on average eight to 10 years before seeking help or intervention for their mental illness symptoms. Another fact of fiction for all of you, and I'm going to bring up our second poll here. Um, oops. Let's see if I can do this here. Uh, relaunch poll. Um, See how I do this here. Um, I apologize, but you can get ready to answer. Um, here we go. That's how I do it. Fact or fiction? So 50% of all chronic mental illness begins around age 25. What do all of you attending think? It'll tend to begin around age 25. And we'll end the poll in three, two, one. And I'll share the results for all of you. And you can see that over 80% of you are now saying that this is fiction. So let's see what the answer is here. And over 80% of you this time are correct. Um, it is fiction because it actually, over 50% of all chronic mental illness will begin by age 14. So a very young age. And one last poll that I'm going to now launch for you. 
is uh, fact or fiction stigma is a reason that people don't seek help for mental health challenges. Is stigma one of the reasons people won't seek help? And I think I threw all of you a softball here, so I'm going to end this poll pretty quickly here and show the results. Um, but over, you know, almost all of you are saying yes, this is fact. Um, and I will stop sharing those results and I'll show you that yes, that is indeed fact. Uh, stigma is a huge barrier uh, to people seeking help. And we at United Way, along with our partners, some of whom you'll hear from very shortly here, are working very hard to eliminate that stigma. So with that being said, I am actually now going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and our panel moderator today, Benny Westgore. So Benny, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Andrew, quick note, if you'll check the waiting room, I think our fourth panelist is, is there. Um, but thank you everyone for coming. You are here today joining us to hear from the experts in our field, which we are lucky enough to also have as our partners at United Way Fox Cities as we focus on mental health. So the first thing I'd like to do today is just let each of um, the panelists give a short introduction about themselves, about the organization that they work for and their role. Um, we do have panelists today from Catalpa Health, from Friendship Place, from Family Services, um, and NAMI Fox Valley. So again, thank you to our panelists for being here. And Mary, I'm just going to go ahead and start with you and ask if you want to start the introductions, please. Okay, thanks, Benny. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Mary Downs, and I have the honor of serving as the president and CEO of Catalpa Health. Um, Catalpa was originally formed um, through a really unique collaborative partnership of three local healthcare systems, Theta Care, Ascension, and Children's Hospital, and the community. So we really view that we have four partners who help us in the work that we do. Um, each year, we serve about 9,000 children across uh, the Fox Cities. Um, we provide a number of services to those children. So we provide therapy, psychological testing, psychiatry, which is diagnosis and medication management, um, we also have intensive outpatient therapy and case management. And we do that through three clinics. We have clinics in Appleton, Oshkosh, and Wapaka. We also serve children in over 50 schools. Some of that is supported by the United Way through the PATH program. Um, we also have partnerships with the Community Early Learning Center, the YMCA, uh, and a number of other partners in the community. Um, and again, we're... we're um, Really honored and feel very fortunate for our partnership with the United Way. And for those of you who are investors in the United Way who are on the call today, thank you. Uh, it's because of you that we can provide services through the PATH program and also that we can provide case management services to some of the children that we serve that have some of the most complex needs. So thank you and I'm thrilled to be here. Excellent. Thanks, Mary. Glad you're here too. I'm just going to follow my screen. Lori, if you feel like unmuting and introducing yourself next, go ahead. Hi, my name is Lori Hill. I'm executive director of Friendship Place. We are a mental health outreach facility in downtown Nina area, serving all of the Fox Cities area to Oshkosh, Green Bay. Whoever can get here, you know, we would gladly provide services. We provide day services that include anything that is for socialization, recreation, and educational purposes um, based on mental health. So our goal is to give individuals a, a place to come so that they can acquire skills to help them um, with their mental health concerns. But we provide a multitude of um, services for them so that they can live well in our community and feel like a contributing member in society today. Excellent. Thanks, Lori. Glad you're here too. If I'm following my Brady Bunch Square, Katie, you're next. Hi there. My name is Katie Rappel and I am the program manager for um, Menasha Outpatient Clinic of Family Services. Family Services serves um, Northeast Wisconsin, so we provide um, a range or a continuum of services from residential to day treatment, um, outpatient, some community-based programs, um, and also PASS. So we serve three different school districts um, with help with um, from Fox Valley United Way, and so I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you. Great, thanks, Katie. Maren, welcome. You are uh, finishing out our introductions here. If you want to unmute yourself and just tell us a bit about yourself. 
Hi, everyone. My apologies for, for being a few minutes late. Somehow I got stuck in a waiting room, but I am Maren Peterson, Executive Director of NAMI Fox Valley, and um, NAMI is a regional affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and we provide mental health support, education, and outreach um, in Outagamie, Calumet, Wapaka, and Northern Winnebago counties. Um, much of our programming is peer-based, so um, uh, the vast majority of our programming is led and facilitated by individuals who themselves have lived experience with mental health challenges or are family members of individuals with mental health challenges. Um, and so uh, we provide a, a wide array of services, which you can check out on our website at www.namifoxvalley.org. And I am really happy to be here today uh, sharing with United Way supporters because NAMI Fox Valley really relies on and is grateful for our partnership with United Way and all of the programming we provide. Excellent. Thank you, Maren. Um, so as you all can see, our attendees, we really do have the experts here today. We're in for some good conversation. A reminder, if you have questions for any of our panelists, you can type them into the Q&A box. And I think there's a raise hand feature if you care to um, uh, ask that at a later time. So I will get started here with our first um, question to get us going. And this is for everyone. Um, the first question is, what is the temperature of mental health in the Fox Cities right now? What are you all seeing from your related fields? How is that relating to what we're all still living through? Um, and I'm actually gonna go ahead and just start with uh, Katie for this question. Thanks, Benny. I think that, um, you know, over the last year, for sure, you know, I would like to describe it as kind of a hum, right? People have been all, every person has been impacted by the pandemic on some level, whether that be stress related to expectations of society, you know, parents working, um, just increased anxiety, stress, isolation. And so family services has had a significant increase in people reaching out for support, especially in the last, you know, five, six months where people have really started to feel like there is no end in sight with the pandemic and that this has lasted much longer than people may have originally thought it would. And so we think about just how kids are impacted and not only kids, but adults too in schools and, and how we've delivered services with PATH this year in 2020 specifically has been very different in the past. And um, our agency specifically had to do a really quick shift for telehealth and we're, we're working and learning how we can provide really good care via telehealth as well. But I think overall as, as a community as a whole, we are all experiencing kind of an increase in needs and intensity of needs of our clients, increase in suicides, increase in anxiety, stress, depression, all of those things. So I think overall we are all experiencing a large significant increase in needs. Mary, how about you? What are you what's your take on the temperature of mental health at the moment? Yeah, well, I would echo uh, much of what Katie said. Um, and, you know, the thing that we're seeing now is that normally at this time of year, our volumes would start to go down uh, because kids are actually getting closer to the end of the year and, and we're past some of those what traditionally would be peak stressors. I mean, we're not seeing that now. Um, our demand is continuing to be high and perhaps even higher than it has been in the past. And so there's all of the COVID stuff that Katie was talking about. And now that we're kind of entering this post-COVID world, maybe sort of, um, there's also some new stressors that go with that. So for instance, kids want to go back to what they have been doing. Everyone wants to go back to what they have been doing but it feels different. Um, or there might be some anxiety that goes with that. Or people are making decisions saying, well, you know, I used to do that and I'm not sure I wanna do that anymore. Um, so there's just kind of this whole nother layer of um, things on top of that. Um, and in addition for kids, uh, especially the, the impact that, that uh, COVID had on their academics um, it has, has really been in some cases pretty profound. So there was some data shared by the Appleton Area School District of the percentage of high school seniors who had um, received an F in a, in a class. So there's that um, 
there's that effort of how do you get back in there or now a year, a little over a year has passed. And so now maybe the, uh, the standards are higher because you're getting closer to needing to go to college or whatever. So there's, so there's all the normal stuff plus the COVID stuff plus the coast COVID stuff. Yeah, that's a really good point. And we're all feeling it too. Um, Mara, and I'll, I'll turn it to you here to answer this one, the temperature of mental health from your perspective. Sure. I am, um, like Mary, I would echo a lot of what Katie said, and I would also echo a lot of what Mary said. Um, certainly, we are seeing uh, an increase in um, mental health symptoms in our community. And as we know, nationally and worldwide, um, this is not, uh, not specific to us, obviously. Um, I, nationally, I read recently that the, the reports of symptoms of anxiety and depression over the past year quadrupled. They've gone mm -hmm. up by 400%. That, that's a huge number um, and really speaks to the impact that COVID has, has had and, and COVID and the, and the accompanying restrictions and life changes have had. Um, so we really have, have seen the impact of those numbers at NAMI. Our support groups, which have been meeting virtually over the past 15 months, um, the numbers not only, uh, we were worried when we went virtual that the, the numbers would go down, that people wouldn't participate. Not only did they not go down, our support group participation has gone up a lot. Um, and so we are offering more support groups than ever before. They're participated in at a higher level than ever before. Um, so people are really reaching out and um, needing and finding, what, which is the good news, and finding um, support from one another um, as, as we've navigated the past year and as we start to think about the transition um, that we're about to go into this, as Mary uh, talked about, into the kind of post-COVID-ish world. Um, so the need is very high, but we are lucky to live in a community where the supports are, are available. People can find their way to them. Yeah, that's a good point. Lori, how about you? I like the other great panels that we have, you know, we're experiencing very similar. Um, I think referrals have changed in the last year during COVID. So many of our referrals were coming directly from county services. Um, directly from Health and Human Services and Behavioral Health Services in the community. Um, but during COVID, it really was anybody, doctor's offices, um, private psychiatrist's office, but direct hospital referrals, we've actually seen quite an increase from. Um, people not knowing what to do, what resources are available. Um, Friendship Place was fortunate to remain open during the entire time serving people, um, but we also had to follow CDC guidelines, which reduced how many we could have um, at capacity and who we could serve and, and finding referrals for people that maybe we weren't able to serve. I think much like Marin said, you know, we thought services, um, access to services might decrease, um, especially with some of the virtual things that we were able to provide. And we saw exactly what Marin and everybody is saying is there's an increased desire for services that we have available. Um, and it's, and how do we get those services? We also have the complexity of we're in a pandemic. How do we get people in for services, right? So we still provide um, in-house services and you're already anxious, right? Everybody already is struggling with their mood disorder and you're asking them to go to outdoors um, into a facility that they're not familiar with. Um, and so we had to change a lot of our policies and how we take those referrals so that people can be the safest and most comfortable to access our services at Friendship Place. And then keeping up to date of what are the services that are currently being provided and how do we get people to those resources. So definitely a challenge. Um, Post-COVID will be interesting. Um, I very much am concerned about transitions that people will be going to. I think we've all a new pattern of normal, right? We've created this new normal in where we're at and what happens when we shift again and what does that look like? And, and I think we all feel that anxiety of, of what, what does post COVID even mean and how do we move, move forward to that specifically to our mental health and protecting all of our own mental health. Just a quick follow up on that, Lori, and anyone else can join in as well. You mentioned um, new pathways for, to referrals that you're getting, you know, started mostly with county and now they're coming from kind of all over. Do you feel like that was just underused before COVID or do you think that might be something uh, different types of referrals might continue because it's better to get more people to the care they need through any channel? I think I, I definitely would like to see forward that we can do as much as possible to get people the resources. 
Um, a lot of it was COVID based. So typically we were open and we're a mental health outreach facility where people can go. So you didn't need a referral to come here. You can be a self referral. Um, but due to COVID, we really needed to have a first time visit. We needed to go over some of the new guidelines um, and to better help people transition into what it was like to utilize a facility while during a pandemic. So how, you know, what guidelines were we following and how are we keeping everybody safe? Um, I have very much appreciated how, um, thanks to the help of United Way and putting a lot of us together, that we were much more likely to have those warm send-offs um, because we wanted to make sure that when we were giving somebody a referral, that it ended up in an actual referral. I, you know, mm -hmm. our, our goal is to not refer them to a services that, that may not be operating currently. So I very much see going forward the, the, the way that we've all been able to work together um, to be able to get people the resources that they need in the community. I would just add to that too, you know, in terms of family services and the way that we have gathered referrals, I agree with Lori, we have received referrals from many different places. And I think part of that from what we're hearing from clients is, you know, it's easier to talk about anxiety or stress or depression when everyone is kind of dealing with a similar thing. So it's mm -hmm. easier to walk into, you know, church or a doctor or your dentist and say, I'm struggling because we most of the time clients have shared that the other person can understand and validate because we're living through something very similar. So it's it's been interesting when I think about stigma and when I think about the pandemic where we're all living through it and we're helping clients live through it at the same time that we're living through it. It's been very validating, I think, for clients to feel like people understand and people can validate more. If I can just add a, a word to that, uh, Katie, I, I really have seen that too and totally agree with what you're saying and have gotten feedback from, from multiple individuals and how much easier they're finding conversations about mental health to be right now. It's a really interesting point. Um, I think that, that mental health, because of COVID and because we most of us are experiencing mental health effects, whether or not that's mental illness or um, everyone's experiencing some kind of mental health effect from COVID. And um, it's just, it's made it that much more easy for people to be able to talk about it and for people to learn about the resources and seek treatment. It's, it's a silver lining of a pretty terrible situation, but definitely a silver lining of it. And we had an interesting situation where a parent reached out to us because their child had actually gone through services with us before COVID and commented that, that their daughter was much better able to navigate through the challenges of COVID because of their past treatment. And so it also really shows the, the value that, um, you know, seeking, seeking support for mental health, um, it helps you in the moment, hopefully, and hopefully it also helps uh, build skills and resiliency that um, really last for the long term. And so I think that's why, again, you know, investing in mental health is so important uh, because it matters now and it matters decades into the future. Yeah, great points from everyone. Great points on that question. Um, I am seeing questions coming in in the Q&A and I'll get to a couple of those in just a moment. I do wanna follow up this though with we're looking, we just looked at kind of the current temperature, what's happening now. Um, and one of the bigger questions we're, we're starting to ask is what do the next six to 12 months look like? How do we even begin to put that lens in front of us when we are still currently living in the in the scenario we're living and Mary I agree we're it's like we're turning a little bit um out of this but we're still kind of in it so um what do you expect to see in the next six to twelve months um and Maren why don't I go ahead and just start with you this time yeah I think as as some people have alluded to we're at a really interesting point right now because having undergone kind of the the upheaval and in some very real respects the trauma of of the COVID world, um, not just the disease itself, but the way that it, it changed so much in society. Um, as I think Lori mentioned earlier, people have, have had, you know, a long time now to kind of make adjustments and get used to what was initially a really abrupt traumatic change and now have adapted to 
um, you know, I think the phrase new normal is overused, but for lack of a better easy phrase, have adapted to kind of a new normal in their own life, whatever that looks like for them. And now we are starting to see shifts back, or if not back, shifts to something different. And even though that's positive in the sense that, okay, we're, we are um, making progress and being able to, to defend against this, this particular disease, and we are making progress and being able to have more options in our lives and in the ways we interact in society, um, which is positive. At the same time, okay, now this means we're going to have to change again. This means there's going to have to be new uh, adjustments in our lives, in our families, in our professional lives that we're going to have to make. And it's almost a continuing trauma or another trauma of sorts to have another abrupt shift um, to change our lives again, even though it's for positive reasons. Um, so I think we are going to continue to see over the next you know, half year, year, yes, and even beyond, um, uh, mental health um, reactions to not to, to COVID, to what we've undergone over the last year and a half, and to what we are about to undergo now that'll cause um, new, new complications for mental health. So, you know, they talk about kind of the shadow um, shadow pandemic or the epidemic within a pandemic of, of mental health. And it kind of follows our, what we've been undergoing with, with COVID. Um, and I, I think we will, will very much continue to see mental health effects, um, not just for the next six months a year, but, but for quite some time potentially after that. Um, and maybe magnified though in the next six months over what it's been in the last six months because we're about to undergo another big change. Mm -hmm. Kind of a wordy response, but hopefully that made, made some sense. That's what we're here for. We're here to learn. So that's great. Yeah. Mary. Um, you know, one of the other things that I think we're going to con continue to see over the next six to 12 months is first of all, I think the demand for mental health services is going to continue to be high. Um, you know, right now, um, the state of access in our community and mental health services is not great because again, because demand is so high. Um, and at the same time, the people who are providing those services are also dealing with their own, um, their own anxiety, uh, their own, you know, they've gone through socialized, they've gone through the same, to use the phrase trauma um, that Marin has talked, everybody has gone through that own trauma on their own. Um, family changes, whatever. And so some of our caregivers, um, you know, may start to um, lower the number of hours uh, that they're working, or they may leave the field uh, temporarily or, uh, you know, forever, or they might determine that their work-family life balance uh, needs to change. And that will cause some additional stressors on an already stressed system of care in our community. Um, and so that's just something that I think we need to be conscious of. There isn't, unfortunately, there's not an easy solution to that, but I think it's a very real problem because I know I was on a different call this morning where um, everyone is um, struggling to try to find additional care providers, whether that's therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. And that is definitely a, a trend in our community and a great need. Great point. Uh, Katie? Thoughts on the next six to 12? Yeah, I was, I was going to echo um, both Marin and Mary just in, you know, people are scared. People, you know, this is, this is looked at by many as a positive thing. We're moving into a different direction, but people are scared about the next transition. They're scared about what do we do next? Should I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? Like there's a lot of anxiety around even moving in a positive direction. And I think to echo Mary's point, I was on a call yesterday too, and we were talking about that predicament where the, ink, the demand is going up, but providers are burnt out. They've gone through their own, you know, traumas. And so it, it is a real need in our community about balancing out. How do we provide all of this care, but yet take care of the people that are providing the care? Because, and that's in all aspects, medical fields, mental health, all, because it's been a lot. And I think over the next six to 12 months, we are just going to start to unpack the trauma that people have experienced. And this is going to be a long-term 
endeavor where people are going to start to really feel the effects because it, it's been scary for a lot of people. Indeed. Lori, what do you think? I too, I think echo a lot of what people are saying, um, but for a better understanding of Friendship Place services, many of the individuals coming to Friendship Place are coming here to fight social isolation. So they're coming into a facility to be with other um, peers and staff members to help them build the skills to live well. Now put in a pandemic um, and we're told to build a little bubble, right? So many of us um, being in this really safe bubble, we've gotten comfortable in our homes for the most part, but much like one has said so well, you put everything else on that and now that transitioning from my safe little bubble to go out into services and what does that look like? Um, I'm very concerned about the transitions people have. Many of our members are struggling with that as even the most recent CDC guidelines of removing of the mask. Um, and you know, our individuals, our members have done great at wearing masks and 100% um, have been masked while in the facility. And there's almost now that fear of what does it feel like to not have that mask on, right? And I think we've all experienced that. We've gone into somewhere where now masked and what is, what's the impact on us? Um, and so for us, we're very concerned about the increase in socialization, that's the isolation that's happened over the last year, which is the very reason why Friendship Place um, has existed. And what do we do about that? How do we better serve the individuals that have now been removed and have that much more anxiety about re-entering society and a society that none of us know what's going to look like? You know, quite frankly, we don't know what, it, what will be this you know, post pandemic. And, and I completely agree with Marin that increase of anxiety of the, just that impending change, because we know change is coming, right? There's new guidelines all the time. Um, and what will this look like? And what if people start getting sick again? And I think is a lot of what our members are experiencing is, you know, I'm safe, and you're telling me to come out of that safe bubble. But what if we have to go back in um, and things like that? So a lot of those unknowns, which I don't know if any of us are ever uncomfortable with the unknowns. And so uh, very concerned of what the six to 12 months and then how do we get people the services? We all know that we're gonna see an increase in requests for services. How do we get anybody from birth you know, on um, the services that they require in the area? Um, we're seeing it with teachers, the retirement rate of police department, teachers, uh, mental health professions, we know that there's a crisis in our community with the amount of retirement in the last year and us not being able um, to take in enough applicants, much like in the employment uh, world in itself. There is more jobs available than there are employees to fill those jobs at this time. Um, and I think, you know, that's the last thing that we, the problem that we want to have in mental health is that we don't have enough providers to access to be able to fill the positions that all of our agencies are going to be experiencing. Yeah, great, great points. And it, it just dawned on me as we're talking about the next six to 12 months, we also just shared a fact earlier in this presentation about how the delay in symptoms, onset of symptoms to support is eight to 10 years. So maybe at some point, goodness, we should start looking at what happens in eight to 10 years, right? Um, switching over here to a few of the questions that we've, that have been submitted. Um, and actually, Lori, you were just touching on some of this, and I'm sure everyone else can, can jump on too, but we had a question ask, what are you seeing with older adults in social isolation? Um, you know, we're, a lot of us here are focusing on youth, but the fact is we're focusing on anyone. So maybe I'm just gonna start with, um, with Marn on this one and let you start if you have any uh, insight into what you're seeing with older adults in social isolation. Um. Yeah, I think that there, there is uh, one of the unique things about older adults, not for all, certainly there are older adults who are very tech savvy, but there are many older adults who are not as comfortable and familiar with the um, technology that has been utilized so much over the past year plus um, to maintain some sort of social connection. And so I do think there's been a sense of isolation among older adults that is um, perhaps different uh, than in the younger generations. I do think that um, as we start to come out of needing so many restrictions, um, 
while I think there will be anxiety as Lori just talked about, and for all the reasons Lori just talked about, I also think that, that for our older adults, this will be, for at least for NAMI Fox Valley's programming, um, really a blessing of being able to offer some in-person programming once again, because we haven't seen quite the level of participation in virtual programming from people in those older generations. Um, so I'm really looking forward to being able to hopefully have some increased participation um, in our programming from, from those individuals. That's great. Um, Mary, maybe I'll move it to you next. Um, well, and so was this specifically about seniors and, and isolate, social isolation? Because the question was older adults, so we can certainly we could we can focus on that, or or maybe you know even thirty plus as, as older adults. Um, well, and again, I don't know that. I mean, I'll I'll defer to the experts on here. You know, we really we serve uh, children under the age of eighteen, but again, we we've seen social isolation with children as well, uh, because their their pattern, so much of their development involves um, just interacting with people. And uh, a lot their their world has certainly um, become smaller in the last year, and so we're seeing that as kids are re-entering the classroom or re-entering activities. Great, Katie. Do you have anything you want to add to that? I think I I think I would echo um, both Lori and Marin just about. I think our population that we serve, you know, in terms of. Um, older adults has been slower to return to in-person services, more hesitation, but I do think that they're excited. I think that they want to get that back because we've had to be creative around technology and how do we reach out and how do we stay connected. And I think um, the other point is just, you know, with children, we are seeing an an alarming increase in CPS referrals because kids have been isolated at home with potentially unsafe or unhealthy people. And so we are seeing an increase in, you know, child protective protection referrals and, and with older adults too, an increase in abuse reports with nursing homes. So I think again, we're going to, it's, this is going to be a long haul in terms of the trauma that we, people have experienced that they haven't been able to talk about and people haven't been able to know because we haven't been able to visit or to see them or to stay in contact. Yeah, good point. Um, we have another question from Sarah and Sarah is asking, do you think that the pandemic was a trigger for mental health issues that were being ignored? Meaning was there other trauma being avoided and the pandemic brought it to the surface? It's a really great question. Um, I'm going to open this up to anyone who'd like to start here. I'd be happy to speak on that. I, I think yes, Sarah. I think um, as you know, one of the, the fun facts that we shared before is um, many of uh, the time of onset of mental health is not um, it you know, can be a triggering event at that time, but there's usually underlying concerns that people have had. It's just that the time that they actually seek services, there's that lag in time. So yes, I, I do agree that I think that we had the amount of people, those statistics haven't changed. You know, pre-COVID, it was about 25% of the adult population had a diagnosable mental illness in any given year. And so I think those issues already existed and then were completely compounded by a pandemic. And I think everything around the pandemic being very triggering for past traumas have gone through. So I would say, you know, absolutely, Sarah, I think um, the pandemic itself, um, you know, is going to be responsible for future trauma and triggers that individuals may be struggling with their mental health. But a lot of the struggles were here prior to the pandemic um, and its magnitude that it's had on us. I think it just, it really um, exemplified some of the symptoms that people were, were experiencing. Um, and much like Katie said, it also, the, the positive of it, it's given us a platform to be better able to talk about mental health because there are so many people struggling with mental health. And now that everyone's kind of been going through those struggles, it definitely gives a healthier platform to say, hey, I'm really struggling, you know, and, and you know your neighbor is struggling and you know, you know, all these people that you have are struggling. Um, but certainly the pandemic has exemplified 
the symptoms that people were, were already experiencing pre-pandemic. Pre, uh, and I'll, I'm, I'm gonna like kind of twist the question just a little bit. Um, so not so much about, about hiding symptoms, but like for instance, one of the things that we've seen is um, with youth and young adults um, who are LGBTQ, um, their, their support system, their safe places uh, may have disappeared during the pandemic. So if, if they had um, folks in their school who they were safe with, or if they were safe on their college campus, and then moving home, and particularly if um, their family is not accepting um, of them, though that's one of the changes, for instance, we've seen where COVID has really kind of exempt. So, and I, I don't want to label that as a as a um, as a trauma that was ignored, but it's just a, it's a change in the structure, the support structure around people that has then, um, in some cases, led to um, you know increased. Um, increased pain um, for, for folks who have lost their support system. And so a need to, to reconnect, um, whether that's to peers, or to, safe, uh, to safe places or to professionals. Anyone else wanna chime in on, uh, on that question? Okay. Um, we do have another question here in the Q&A. Um, and, and it's an interesting topic because it's all around us right now around vaccines. So I just want to preface, um, preface the question. But one of our attendees asked, are there any of your organizations that are requiring vaccines for staff or members coming in? Um, are you asking people to be vaccinated before they come in? And I would actually add to that question. That's a, you know, that's a whole other, other topic, right? When we're talking about mental health and what we feel comfortable with. Um, so anyone that wants to begin, take that on perhaps and, and uh, share a little bit with what you're doing at your organization. Um, well, I can speak to it because the mask, the, the change last week in the CDC guidelines, um, you know, obviously a lot of places are doing away with their mask, uh, their masking requirements. But in our case, the majority of, I mean, our patients don't have access to the vaccine or, you know, or they do if they're, if they're 12 or over. But so we are continuing to have that, that mask mandate. Um, anytime someone is in a space where they might be interacting with a client or a client family. Um, and so we'll continue to reassess. Um, but, and we have not required um, vaccines because we have some staff members who have reasons that they're not able to get vaccinated. Um, and then for their own safety though, then we ask that they continue to wear masks because we do want to keep them safe as well as uh, keeping the children who we are caring for safe. I can echo that. Oh, um, family, family services has not required our staff to become vaccinated. Um, similarly to Mary's statement, you know, if, if, if a staff member is not vaccinated, we will ask that the masks stay on, but we are not requiring vaccinations of staff. That's, uh, that's the okay. same for us as well at NAMI Fox Valley. We are not requiring staff vaccinations for, for the reasons already spoken to. Some people have, have reasons that are very legitimate reasons for, for not receiving a vaccination. Um, and we ask that those who are not vaccinated um, continue to wear their, their masks as well. And we have very similar at Friendship Place. Um, we were fortunate that staff were able to get vaccinated early um, back in late January. Um, and we certainly strongly encourage those that are comfortable and willing to be vaccinated. But at this time, we will require um, to continue to wear masks in our facility, as at this point, there is not a mandate for staff or the members that utilize our services and to continue to keep everyone safe um, and who we go home to and things like that. Not, um, require vaccinations, but we do require mask wearing at this time. Oh, that's great. I, I commend all of you because, again, this is one of those new types of questions that's coming up that we are living through and trying to answer moment by moment. Um, and as we know, as things continue to change, those answers may change too, but thank you for being, for being candid with your responses. We have a, um, uh, one more question I'm gonna ask that's directed to Katie. In, in the meantime, we do have time for about one more question if anyone wants to type one in the Q&A very quickly. Um, and so while we, while we wait for that, Katie, a question directly for you is what are the three school districts that you cover? 
Sure, Family Services provides services at, um, through Kimberly School District, Little Shoe, and Kokona. Okay. Great. Um, I'm gonna take, since we have no more questions, about three more minutes before turning it back to Andrew to finish up. If any of you have any um, uh, final comments, um, anything that didn't get asked today that you'd like to share about your organization, about the work you're doing, um, maybe collaborative efforts and why they're important, but we have a few, a few moments. If you have any last thoughts you'd like to share, I'll open it up to our panelists. Well, I would just like to take a moment again to thank the United Way and to thank um, the supporters of the United Way who may be on the call today. Um, because your work, uh, again, the, the two programs that, that are supported at Catalpa through the United Way, um, one is the PATH program, which provides access to mental health services in schools. And that um, is so wonderful in that it removes barriers that might have been in the way of these kids receiving care elsewhere. That might be transportation barriers, uh, parents having inflexible employment, financial barriers. Um, and so that has made a huge difference in the lives of those, of those kids. The other program um, that is supported is a case management program um, that supports care last year to over um, 600 of our, the children that we serve who are either being hospitalized or being released from the hospital or have some other pretty significant uh, barriers to care. And so again, being able to remove those barriers and getting them connected into the level of care that they need when they need it is literally saving lives. And so I just want to thank um, the United Way and the United Way supporters for that support. I would, would just echo that um, in terms of thanking United Way. Not, at NAMI Fox Valley, we could not, um, we could not offer many of the opportunities that we're able to offer to people without that partnership with United Way. It really is a significant um, part of, of how we operate that we have that partnership with United Way. And um, it has also just been uh, for, for our organization a blessing to have the collaboration with other agencies um, that United Way helps connect us with I mean, United Way really facilitates um, connections among the various nonprofits with whom they work. And it really makes all of us, I guess I shouldn't speak for, for anybody else. I, I would say it certainly makes us at NAMI Fox Valley a better agency for the work that we're able to do with, with our peer agencies. Great. Thank you um, to our panelists. I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrew now to kind of wrap us up for the day. All right, thank you very much, Benny. And I also wanna thank our panelists um, who are excellent partners of United Way and uh, collaborators and partners with each other as well, as Marvin alluded to. So thank you all so much for coming on and informing us about the current state of mental health and, and what's coming up, unfortunately, um, in this arena and what we need to be looking out for. I'm gonna share my screen one last time here, just have a few things I want to share with to kind of hit home here with, but um, speaking of United Way and us investing in mental health services, it's very important and a priority at United Way Fox Cities for us to do so. And in the last two years, 2019 and 2020, we've been able to reach over 20,000 adults and children to help them receive mental health support and services. So an outstanding number, we're very happy to hear that, but we're also, you know, it, it speaks to the need that's out there that all of our partners have spoken to. And unfortunately, we're probably gonna see this number continue to grow and climb over the next several years before we can turn the curve and start seeing a decline in these numbers. Uh, we do have other mental health partners besides these four wonderful partners here on this panel. We work with 10 mental health partners in all, all of which were able to creatively shift how they're able to provide their services in this past year and upcoming for the next six to 12 months and beyond of how they're gonna be uh, providing their services and, and providing the support to uh, the individuals that need it so much. Just want to talk about Mary uh, brought up the PATH program. Both um, Catalpa Health and Family Services are providers of our PATH program, providing access to healing. Uh, the program was established in 2008, and it, as Mary alluded to, it eliminates barriers uh, as much as we can for uh, the young adults and children to receive the mental health services they so sorely need. 
And we are happy to report since 2008 in conception of this program, we've now been able to reach and serve over more than 2,000 students, which is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, to give you a sense, in 2008, we started it in, in one school district. And then over the years, we have now grown it to all school districts, 10 school districts in the five cities and 37 schools and, and continuing to grow that. The idea is to get it across all levels of the school district, both elementary, middle and high school. And you would think high schools were needed most. And, you know, I definitely needed at all levels, especially the elementary level. And I'm sure Mary could speak a whole nother hour or two about that. So. Uh, but we've had phenomenal results and success with this program. Uh, as, as you can see, I'm not going to read through them all, but that last one really sticks out, right? The return on our investment in these services that we're going to be seeing years to come down the road is astronomical. Uh, and so we're, a lot of savings that we'll see by helping these more than 2,000 children that we've been able to help since 2008 and hopefully uh, hundreds more in the years to come. So, you know, one question that I always ask and I like to, you know, um, when I when I hear about things like these is what can I do? How can I help? Right. Like what what difference can I really make? And so 211, if you're not aware, is an information and referral service that we operate at United Way Fox City. And very simply, just knowing about this number 211 similar to 911 is going to be a help because whenever you run across a colleague, a friend, a neighbor, anyone that is maybe struggling with their mental health illnesses and thoughts. You can re suggest to them, hey, tell you what, just pick up your phone and dial 211. I don't care if it's two in the morning or two in the afternoon, just dial 211 and you're gonna talk to somebody, a real live person, not a robot, and you're gonna get directed to local services such as Family Services, PATH, NAMI, um, a, a Friendship Place and others that can really help you. Uh, and they're going to do, as somebody alluded to earlier, that warm handoff. We're not just going to give you the phone number and say, good luck, hope you call them. But we're really going to connect them and make sure they're following through with getting these services. So, it, again, it's it's free. It's confidential. It's available 24-7 in our area, United Way Fox Cities. We actually serve a 10-county area. And last year, we answered over 20,000 calls. Uh, that was a huge jump from previous years. In 2019, I believe it was... Uh, just over 12,000 calls. So we almost doubled the number of calls that we received last year for obvious reasons uh, as I don't need to get into. So other ways that you can help though, besides just knowing about 211 and referring people to that number, of course, is uh, if so inclined you can give to United Way, Fox Cities during the campaign time at your company, or if your company doesn't run a campaign, we'd love to talk to you about your company doing so. As an individual, you can always uh, choose to invest in United Way Fox City so that we can invest it in our wonderful partners, such as the ones you've heard from today. So as you can see on the screen, it doesn't take a lot to make a huge difference. And a little bit can go quite a long ways in making a difference in the lives of people. So with that, just kind of want to wrap up. We do have a large impact at United Way Fox Cities. We're very happy to work with our partners. Um, and we're able to impact in all one in three people in the Fox Cities through our investments in all of our partners and services that we invest in right here in the Fox Cities. We're not including any other area, but one in three people here in the Fox Cities, over 100,000 people are impacted by United Way funding programming. And it really, it starts with all of you that are on this call today. That's where it starts. And that's why we want to provide this series. So you really have a better understanding of where your dollars are going, where those investments are going, where the challenges lie and, and where the opportunities lie for us to provide solutions to those challenges. So last but not least, going to quickly just uh, remind you, we do have, this is first part of a four part series. Next part is coming up in June, mid June, June 16th on education. We have for panelist uh, partners that are coming on to speak about their work uh, and investments we do in their work around education. We also have a United Way 101 coming up. If you just wanna learn more about United Way 101, who we are, what we do on a very high level overall, uh, that will be coming up on June 1st, which is in a couple of weeks already, unbelievably. Um, and you can register on our website and our events page and find information about that. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, one last time, I do want to thank our panelists um, 
for their time and and all their wonderful efforts and all of your staff at all of your organizations for the incredible work that they all do and hopefully we can also provide solutions to avoid the burnout that we heard about a little bit earlier right so uh, we'll see what we can do with that um we do have a couple minutes i'm going to open it up to our audience here if there's anyone that does have a last minute question they'd like to ask you can raise your hand or throw it in the Q&A, or if you have anything you want to chat, I see a couple of people. Karen has said, thank you. It was a wonderful update. Thanks for all you do. Thank you very much for your words, Karen. Um, and it looks like uh, Benny has put uh, links to all of the organization's websites in the chat as well for all of you. So I'm not seeing anything else come in. Uh, any last words from any of our panelists? Okay, well, again, thank you all so much. We greatly appreciate the work you do, and we look forward to hearing about wonderful things to come. So thank you so much, and have a great day, everyone.